Hello, I'm Michael Albany. And I'm Patrick Reynolds. And welcome to the first episode in what we are calling Sextra Credits. So basically, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, this is going to be a companion piece to our main podcast, Sex Ed. For those of you who are joining us from Sex Ed, you don't need to worry. This isn't going to be a podcast that replaces Sex Ed. Rather, it's going to be a companion podcast that's going to address certain elements that don't necessarily fit into our main podcast mission. Over at Sex Ed, we generally cover uh, sex, new religious movements, uh, whole categories of faith. But here on Sex for Credit, what we want to do is focus on profiles of individuals and even smaller facets of faith. And that's really good for what we want to talk about today, because what we're talking about is young earth creationism, which is not in, its, in and of itself a sect, but rather a particular facet of faith for uh, certain evangelical and fundamentalist Christians in the United States. So to talk about young earth creationism today, uh, we actually have a guest for this first episode. So uh, he is the media editor uh, for the Activist History Review and also a History PhD candidate and graduate student at Georgetown University. Uh, he received his MA at Georgetown and BA at SUNY Geneso in Western New York before moving to DC. Uh, he taught eighth grade social studies in English in his hometown of Pittsburgh, New York, and his research focuses on slavery, abolition, and migration in the northern United States. Uh, he's currently in the planning stages of a dissertation that will examine the fates of central Pennsylvania's enslaved and slave holding families in the wake of gradual abolition. So please welcome to this first episode of Sex Credit, Corey Young. Welcome, Corey. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Patrick. It's, it's really nice to be here. And um, I, I couldn't help but notice in, in that brief introduction, you, you said Suni Geneso, and that's fine. I have heard so many people pronounce the name of that that college in so many different ways. It's it's SUNY Geneseo, and Geneseo actually comes from a Seneca word. It's in Seneca country in western New York, meaning beautiful valley. And one time, Second City, the improv group, came through, and they must have pronounced it three or four different ways without ever once getting it correct. Geneseo, Genesco, Geneseo. So you, you've... You have inadvertently joined a, a long tradition with with regards to that name. Well, I appreciate you correcting me as someone who uh, studies uh, indigenous history, but uh, isn't the most acquainted with the language yet. I like to be corrected on those things. Both Patrick and I actually worked uh, up in Mackinac uh, before we met. And um, for those who are listening who aren't from Michigan, Mackinac it actually has two different spellings. Uh, one ends with a C, that's uh, the French spelling, so Mackinac Island, and then there's Mackinac City, which is spelled with a W at the end, and that's sort of the English phonetic spelling, but in different records and uh, archival sources I've looked at, you get about 70 different spellings, and I'm sure as much as like, as many different pronunciations of, of that, so... Yeah. It happens. Um, so before we dive into the topic at hand, uh, we want to give you an opportunity to just uh, introduce the Activist History Review. So uh, what exactly is your, your publication site? What can you tell us? So the Activist History Review is the, the brainchild of, of two history PhD candidates over at George Washington University. Bill Horn and Nathan Wurtenberg, and, and Nathan in particular really is responsible for getting this thing moving. In the wake of this past election in the United States, Nathan decided that, that he wanted to create a platform for scholars and activists and workers and all, really all interested parties to have a single space to come together and discuss issues that are, are facing this country in a historical context. We, we, we're pretty much tired of, of the notion that historians should be objective as, as if, you know, of course we strive for objectivity, but the notion that we don't have our own 
own deeply held political views and ideas about about history and the type of history that we want to do, we thought, well, why don't we just pull back that curtain and, and explicitly say this is an activist history platform where the type of history, the type of, of activism is, is part of our mission statement rather than something that we might have to apologize for in a different platform. And so far, I think it's been, it's been going well. We have a nice blend of scholarly pieces and activists promoting their own causes in different cities in the United States. We are hoping to branch out and include more pieces by workers and other individuals who, who have something to say and should have a platform to say it. So that was the original idea behind the Activist History Review, and we are just happy to see where it's going. I appreciate you bringing up sort of that uh, mission of uh, sort of dispelling the misconception that history is meant to be sort of an uh, objective discipline. That's something I hear all the time. History is supposed to be objective. Personally, I think there's a difference between sort of objectivity and um Darn, I'm forgetting the word that uh, I need for this. Um, passivity? Not passivity, but... Um, I, I, would, I would say um, truth, truthfulness, honesty. In, in my mind, uh, objective suggests that there is a single, recoverable, almost scientific past. And there is just no way that, that, <laughs> that that's true. What that doesn't mean is that historians are making things up as we go along, we have a historical method. We are seeking the truth, but depending on what sources you use or choose not to use or what questions you ask, the story is always going to look a little bit different. So I think objective is just the wrong word, but to say that we're not objective is to not say that it is not a discipline rooted in facts, rooted in, in a rigorous method that seeks to tell what happened as well as we can analyze it. Mm-hmm. Impartiality was actually the word I was looking uh, for, but um, but yeah, and I think that's something that, uh, especially for our work, looking into sort of uh, fringe, unorthodox uh, religious movements, you tend to find that depending on the period of time of the sources you're looking at, the authors are very often like their interpretations are colored by a number of different things. Their personal experiences, their uh, sort of agendas are coloring it, and uh, there's different levels of uh, accepting your positionality, of sort of being able to take a step back. Some people do it very well, uh, some people not so much, and then you see all these weird sources that basically just bash the groups that we look at, and those are sort of fun to look at, but also Mm -hmm. sort of disheartening to look through to wade through basically um but yeah and we appreciate you coming on here today we should say that uh this podcast today is actually uh part of a collaborative piece that we're doing so basically we're going to be talking about young earth creationism uh, on this podcast but i've also written uh, a piece on young earth creationism that you can uh, go and check out on the activist history review um It's theactivisthistoryreview.com, and we're going to be posting a specific link uh, to the piece in our show notes notes and basically the link to this podcast. Activisthistory.com, we publish pieces every Friday, and we strive to have a scholarly piece alongside a piece by an activist. We are, uh, this past week, for example... We ran a roundtable, or, or really, I suppose, a, a short dialogue on NPR's recent podcast, S Town, and we had two different scholars reflecting on on what they took away from listening to this podcast, and and we ran that over three consecutive days in the week leading up to our normal Friday publication. So, Friday is a, a good day to check out the website because that's when we have most of our new material. But as we move forward and have more authors and individuals interested in the type of work we're doing, we're hoping to expand out and have more frequent publications. 
Great. So because we have our own publication that uh, you guys can go check out, we're not going to get uh, until the real meat of that. We would definitely encourage you uh, to head over to the Activist History Review uh, to read up. But um, you prepared some questions for us to kind of act as a sort of complement to that. So why don't we get started with that? I did. Great. Thanks, guys. Um, I do have questions about Young Earth Creationism, and I'm, I'm happy to get to those because I think it, it is worth discussing, especially as the two of you, or, or Michael, as you frame it, as as dispelling this tension between young earth creationism, intelligent design, and and science in the 20th century. So we'll get there. But but first, I just wanted to ask the two of you, uh, just as you you so courteously asked me, what is it that the two of you are hoping to accomplish with sex ed? What is it that you felt was missing? From, from the scholarly discourse about religion that prompted you to start this podcast. In uh, daily life, in the, in the religious discourse that, um, that I see all over the internet and also just uh, among people I know is that there's uh, not a great understanding of the nuance in new religious movements and in different sects um, that uh, people tend to talk about these gigantic religions as though they're a monolith and um, people claim to, to speak for an entirety of a religion um, when they are in fact representing a very small uh, specific subset of that religion. Um, and there's there's not a, I guess, an understanding of the diversity of within religious movements of, of how diverse uh, the systems of belief can get. And it's also another thing I hope to accomplish is just I, uh, I hope to find out more about how religions begin um, and what they look like in the early stages and try and spot some patterns there. Um, and it's also just a lot of quite fascinating stories that I love researching. Yeah, as a, as a historian, I consider myself not just a researcher, but also a storyteller. And one of the things that this project gives us a chance to do is sort of not only explore these big questions, but also tell fascinating stories alongside it that uh, may end up opening people's minds up in some ways. We, uh, funny story, before sex ed, uh, Patrick and I actually met before that, and you proposed a different podcast oh, yeah. project where basically, <laughs> um, I think the reason we didn't go forward with that was because we couldn't think of a, a fun name for it, yeah. but the, the idea was to sort of look at historical figures that people know because of like one thing about them. Um, and I guess the best example is William Henry Harrison. If people know William Henry Harrison at all, they know that he's the president who died within 30 days of the presidency. But he's got this whole complex history about him where basically he was uh, the arbiter of Thomas Jefferson's American Indian policy, basically going into the Northwest Territory, taking land from indigenous peoples, doing everything in his power to make you know, slavery, an institution uh, in practice in the Northwest, despite the fact that the Northwest Ordinance forbade it. All of those complex things that people just don't get because they know the one simple thing about him. You can actually, if you're interested more in that story at all, we actually cover it in a bit greater detail in our fifth episode about Tenza Kutawa, because mm -hmm. Harrison and Tenza Kutawa had this Hate, hate relationship yeah. that yeah. Um, that really fits in uh, what we're doing here, but yeah, that I mean that's fantastic. I, as, as someone who, who researches slavery in, in places that most contemporary Americans don't like to think about slavery having existed, I, I would love to learn more about his efforts in the Northwest. You mentioned, you know, that, that you didn't really approach this as, as a means of intervening in a scholarly discourse, but rather to, I, I think you were you were saying, bring it to a more popular attention about the, the nuance of, of religious history. I absolutely agree with with that principle, but I also think it's important to address a scholarly audience. I, I, mm -hmm. As someone who studies 18th century and 19th century U.S. history, I routinely forget how different a religious landscape this time period was. For example, when I was researching slavery in the Hudson River Valley of, of New York in the late 18th century, the, the 1790s, I was looking at the, the 1790 census, the first 
U.S. Census, and I was looking for for large households because I thought I could find find farms there, and I could. The Livingston family, a very a very famous New York family in this time period, had you know some some somewhat something like thirty to to forty slaves on some of their largest farms. But I came across a household that had I want to say eighty six people in it, and I, I couldn't figure out what this was because none of these people were were slaves or free people of color. They were all designated in the census as white, and I did a little bit of research, and it turns out that it was a, a Shaker community, an early Shaker community in 1790s New York, to point to one of your other podcasts as well. So just bringing, I think, some scholarly attention to sex and, and non-traditional or, or uh, heterodox religious traditions has a lot of scholarly value as well. Yeah, I think that's one of the one of the things that we we try to do and hopefully we're doing effectively is sort of toe the line between our audience because we want to address both sort of a an audience of scholars, but we also want to make what we're doing uh, accessible enough that anyone can get into it. For me, I know it's a lot of the sort of things that I would just be going on and on uh, about to various friends. <laughs> And I said, you know, why don't I just record this once <laughs> instead of telling 20 people about the type things one at a time? <laughs> right, so is that how you guys got into podcasts? Because over at the Activist History Review, podcasting is something that we thought of second. We'd like to expand to do more podcasting work, but we immediately went to more traditional written pieces. You know, this is... The, the Activist History Review is, is positioned somewhere between a, a blog and a peer-edited journal, but it's sort of, of course, open access. Is that something that you guys had in mind when you were putting this together, wanting to, to be able to disperse this to as large an audience as possible, make it as accessible as possible? Well, I think that's an element of it because podcasting is a, a major new paradigm right now. Um, I mean, it's pretty much every... Uh, history conference I go to these days seems to have some sort of panel or presentation dedicated to how historians can get into podcasting. I was just at the Omohandro Institute's conference, and one of the one of the panels they just had Liz Covart from Ben Franklin's World, which is a podcast that everyone who's interested in early American history should be listening to. Fantastic. Yeah, it is. Um, she was just uh, there talking about podcasting, and I think that's a good new direction to go, especially if you're trying to reach a general audience, because I think of, uh, as a podcast listener myself, when I have to go on long trips to conferences or different libraries that I'm going to, I will have a podcast going on in the car, um, not to say that we don't want to do written pieces as well, because we have certain ideas for the website to add more written material, but I think there's sort of a, an equalizing element that podcasting have that anyone could just, who's got a smartphone in their car, can just put it on and listen to it. I also, um, I do have a broadcasting background as well, um, so I had all the... Um, the microphones and everything I needed to record it. So that, that definitely influenced my decision. <laughs> but uh, it was right. all sort of sitting around in my room not being used. Right, there, are, there always is that um, very pragmatic pra pragmatic reason to go along with the, the loftier goals like democratizing access to mm -hmm. information, providing different sorts of materials for different types of learners. You know, not everyone learns best by reading. And, and having other ways of spreading information, in my opinion, is always going to be a good thing. Diving a bit more into to why we're here today, Young Earth Creationism, I, I, I think the piece that you guys wrote up is absolutely fantastic. I, I learned a lot from reading it, most notably that, that concepts that I believe to have been a long, around for a long time are, are in fact quite new in the case of intelligent design. So I was hoping you could just speak quickly to the difference between young earth creationism and intelligent design that you, you discuss in the piece, uh, as well as how young earth creationism differs from the early 20th century theories, such as the gap theory that you mentioned, just to get our terminology out there. Sure. So we'll start with the intelligent design question, because much like you, that's a phrase, a term that I thought had been around for much longer. Maybe it's because, you know, 
I was born in 1991, so I basically grew up hearing of it all the time. Um, but in fact, it's it's much newer than you would think. It really starts to coalesce in creationist circles in the 1980s. And then, as they say in the piece, in 1989, you have the first published instance of it uh, in a book called Of Pandas and People. And this book is coming out uh, at sort of a crossroads for uh, for creationists. So uh, basically in 1982, you had a court case called McLean versus the Arkansas Board of Education. And this was a district court decision which basically said that uh, you can't teach what's called creation science in the Arkansas school districts, basically because it violates the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. Creation science is the term that basically young Earth creationists, contemporary young Earth creationists in the 20th century use. So to say in the simplest terms, young Earth creationism is basically the belief, number one, that humans do not have a genetic uh, ancestry with other species. So basically it's the belief that humans did not evolve from uh, from apes or primates or, uh, or primates. Um, as, as Darwin initially theorized, that's the initial controversy. And then also that the Earth is at most about 10,000 years old. So basically, that's the crux of the belief. And uh, throughout the 20th century, different young Earth creationists try to justify this scientifically. And, and that leads to the term sort of changing, taking on scientific uh terminology, whether it's flood geology, whether it's uh, creation science, but basically in the McLean case, the judge ruled that one of the reasons that creation science is not science is because it's not falsifiable. And basically the classic example of a falsifiable statement is uh, all swans are white. That's the classic example. So basically if I say that, well, that's a statement that if I go out and I'm able to identify a black swan, that statement is falsifiable. Saying that the universe was created, or the earth was created in six days by God, as it says in the Old Testament, in Genesis, that's not a falsifiable statement, because for people who believe that, there is nothing you can say that can prove it wrong. Uh, and that's sort of the crux of creation science. Basically, you have that premise that is immutable, that cannot be changed. So when you have the McLean case saying that uh, you can't teach that, and later you have in 1987 another Supreme Court case which determines that in the entire United States, teaching creation science is unconstitutional. You have this publishing house, I believe out of Texas, it's called the Foundation for Thought and Ethics, and they basically they're writing the book of pandas and people, and they have the term creation science in there, in initial drafts. And after these court cases, they realize they can't get this book into public schools with that language. They switch it out to things like intelligent design. Creation scientists become intelligent design proponents or things like that. And that's sort of the origins of it. And Throughout the 90s, moving into the 21st century, in some instances, intelligent design sort of becomes a euphemism for creationism. Basically, if creationists are trying to get creationist teachings into schools, they use intelligent design as a euphemism. But the reason that it's different is because it is, it's basically theologically neutral. Intelligent design, the term is designed in such a way that it does not specifically say that the Christian God is the intelligent force that led to humans appearing on Earth in their present form, led to the creation of the world. And because of that, it is, in theory, open to anyone. Uh, so you can have uh, you can have Jewish intelligence, intelligent design proponents, Muslim intelligent design proponents, pantheistic or polytheistic intelligent design proponents. You can have all of that. Um, and indeed, there are those sorts of people. Um, in my research, I found um, there was uh, one author who basically he compiled uh, a list of basically 
he called them dispatches he wrote from going to different sort of creationist and intelligent design conferences and meetings and things like that. And he goes to one intelligent design uh, meeting and they're just flabbergasted. They're aghast at being compared to creationists. They call them, uh, they basically say, oh, they're, they're a bunch of idiots and Bible thumpers. Those are their words. So they see no sort of connection with young earth creationism. And indeed, that's one of the sort of sticking points between people who are fervently young earth creationist and intelligent design proponents. For example, um, there are certain groups of Muslim intelligent design proponents, and because their belief is not that God is the Trionine God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, with Jesus being basically the the Son of God, that's a major sticking point for people who want to fervently say that it is the Christian God, the God in the Old and New Testament Christian Bible, that's basically the crux of it. It, it sounds to me like a, a square rectangle scenario where not all intelligent design proponents are young earth creationists, but all young earth creationists are proponents of intelligent design. That might be one way to say it, although there are some people who are some young earth creationists who fervently reject the term intelligent design because of the possibility of basically saying that, you know, okay, if we have this there, it's just not enough. In fact, one of the sort of founding fathers of modern young earth creationism, uh, the author of a book called Genesis Flood, uh, which you can read more about in the piece, but basically he says this in no uncertain terms. Basically, you know, intelligent design might help a bunch of uh, might help a bunch of atheists become polytheists, but it's not going to get them to Christianity. That's his main objection with it. Okay, um, so it sounds like despite intelligent design being a way of, of getting philosophical or, or theological thrust behind young earth creationism into schools, it's, it's a way of opening up a discussion of, of alternative forms of human existence beyond evolution, despite mm-hmm. the fact that it allows that conversation to take place. There are some young earth creationists who reject it because it is non-Christian. Yeah, in, in fact, er, in fact, early in the 21st century, like the early 20 aughts, um, you had this guy, Philip Johnson. He's the co-founder of what's called the Discovery Institute. And one of the things you see about lots of young Earth creationist paradigms is they generally emerge in response to sort of new scientific writings and authors emerging the early 20th century with uh, George McCready Price, who's one of these sort of early people at the forefront of young Earth creationism. His book is coming out, uh, his book about flood geology, basically the belief that the Earth is about 6,000 years old, and the way that we can dispel what mo- what contemporary geologists like say is evidence for that is basically the biblical flood. The catastrophe of the biblical flood distorted the evidence that geologists use. So that was coming out at a time when there was a lot of controversy about the teaching of evolution in schools. So, so this book is actually used in the Scopes Monkey Trial. Meanwhile, in the early... 20 aughts in the, or rather the 90s and 20 aughts, this is when Richard Dawkins is writing a lot. And basically, you start to see lots of fundamentalist Christians who don't like Dawkins' ideas that, you know, you can be an atheist who's intellectually fulfilled with, like, there not being a God that created the universe. Like, you can still be fine, you aren't like spiritually bereft or anything or intellectually bereft. And Johnson, one of the things he does is he proposes what's called the wedge strategy. So basically, it's trying to get people who ascribe to intelligent design, which he's using it as a euphemism for creationism, trying to get them into schools so that you can eventually like get more and more people in there and teach it right alongside evolution. And the way that sort of uh, it, it's phrased uh, in a lot of ways is young earth creationists basically say that uh, evolution, it is a theory and it should be taught as a theory. And there's a difference between 
microevolution and macroevolution, microevolution being things that uh, changes in species that we can observe, and creation scientists are fine with that. But macroevolution, the change of, say, primates to humans, that's something you can't ob observe, so we don't believe that. There are all sorts of different scientific ways to refute that, ways that uh, I won't try to get into right now because I'm not a scientist. Um, but, Me neither. But, uh, well, thank you so much for, for clarifying. I have to imagine that if our listeners and readers are familiar with the the idea behind the Genesis flood, it would be through Ken Ham, who you discuss in your piece, and who some of us might know due to his debates with Bill Nye, those those controversial debates, whether it was a, a the correct decision to give Ken Ham a platform next to a very well respected popular scientist. But Ken Ham uh, very fervently believes that the flood as, and I'm, I'm, I'm quoting a comedian, Mark Marin here, effectively wiped away science's ability to be effective in any way, is, is what he says about, about that, that way of thinking. And it creates quite the tension between science and creationism. This is another thing that you guys discuss in your piece, and I have to say very quickly, my ninth grade biology teacher, sort of the first course in which we or I, I received instruction in evolution at a, a high school level. She revealed at the end of the year that that she was a, a creationist from Texas. She didn't teach creation; she taught evolution. She mentioned that intelligent design existed, but did not really teach it as part of the curriculum. And and then once we had taken our regents exams, our state tests in New York, she said that while she teaches it, it is not her personal belief. So even in the 21st century, there are, are science teachers who are, are believers in and proponents of young earth creationism or intelligent design rather than evolution. Yeah, and there's, and there's a major continuity between that and even at sort of the, the start of young earth creationism as a movement. Again, uh, one of the early proponents of sort of saying that the flood wiped out science's ability to be effective in sort of judging the age of the earth. It's a, it's a major point of controversy um, because there are, you have George McCready Price who, who believes that. And basically the reason he's bringing that up is because again, the evolution controversy that's uh, brimming. He basically is reading books about evolution and he's, He's not a dumb guy. He's a smart guy who's trying to educate himself. And um, I think the best way to sort of uh, characterize him is he sort of gets a couple bad breaks in life. Like he he's a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and he wants to sort of be, to go to school and be an educator, but um, he is chronically like without money so he basically has to rely on the church to give him jobs and they end up giving him jobs in schools but not as a teacher he like does construction work for them um and he's reading books about evolution and uh, basically he comes to the conclusion that you can dispute evolution which is based on the idea like you need a lot of time for evolution to make sense well, if you can just prove that the Earth is very young, then you can put uh, a major dent in evolution as a concept. And that's what gets him uh, to try to propose that the flood in Genesis basically uh, made index fossils and all of the sorts of techniques that geologists use to date the Earth, uh, to invalidate them. But... Even other Seventh-day Adventists are kind of, some are kind of wary of him. Like, initially, like, he's writing lots of papers and people aren't really taking him seriously because he's not a professionally trained scientist. And he sort of becomes wary of not science as a discipline, but specifically professionally trained scientists to the point where when another Seventh-day Adventist actually does field work, he um, actually goes out and he studies rocks and he studies geology and he basically says you know these things that price are saying 
once you actually get out into the field and do it, because Price is an armchair geologist, he's just reading and writing about that. Once you actually get into the field, it doesn't make sense. Maybe there's another way that I can coalesce my biblical teaching with scientific methods and Price just lambasts this guy. He says, and I have the quote here, uh, he has the modern mental disease of university-itis. And oh, wow. he's trying to curry the favor of, quote, tobacco smoking, Sabbath breaking, God defying evolutionary geologists. So that's that's beautiful. He, he <laughs> can't. I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that Price, just personally, he cannot take criticism like at all. But but yeah, there's sort of this disconnect between professional science and then sort of people who don't have the degrees but are like we want to be scientists as well and that's what sort of leads into the next development of young earth creationism which is in the 60s you have the genesis flood coming out and the guy who initially writes it he's not a scientist he's a theologian he's a evangelical christian but he basically looks back to price and says you know if i don't approach this with some sort of scientific legitimacy no one's going to take it serious and it a scientist who is also a Christian. He eventually does. He finds a, right. a PhD uh, who can co-author it with him. Which which remains a tactic to this day for fundamentalist Christian scientists trying to to lend some credibility to their to their theories. You always have on, on you know the the news, the go to PhD or, or MD in, in the presidents, it's about global warming and, and climate science. But um, ha- having that appeal to authority seems to have long been a, a popular tradition. Yeah. And I, I think, or, or part of why I enjoyed this, this paper and this conversation so much, is it's a reminder that science and religion do not part ways in the 18th century Enlightenment. Oh. Science and religion remain bound together throughout the 19th, 20th, and into the 21st centuries. But, but even 100 years ago, the, the notion that Christianity and, and biblical literalism were incompatible with science, that idea was not yet fully formed as, as reading about these early 20th century uh, Seventh-day Adventist geologist shows. Yeah, and to get back to your earlier question sort of differentiating between young earth creationism and sort of other theories like there are there were other christians who were around at the time of price who they were not biblical realists in the sense that they needed to say you know the world was formed literally as the bible says in six days you had people uh, like william jennings bryan who basically believed that you know the six days it's sort of symbolic, metaphorical. Six days really represents much longer geological ages. Well, even way before that, this is um, with the creation of of biblical canon, there were these debates over how literally to take the text that eventually became the Bible, and they were very intense debates that went on for hundreds of years that are now sort of being unraveled by, um, and this obviously in in modern discourse, the the word traditional comes up a lot, Um, and I think that's one of the big points is how... um, recent a lot of these approaches are to taking the bible literally i mean even um i'm very very fond of the the sort of late middle ages concept of the book of nature um in galileo where your your observations of the natural world um take precedence over biblical interpretation in some ways where you need to understand both um and uh, again i went back to gnosticism about um yeah what's what should be taken literally and what's a metaphor with the gnostics tending to go it's all symbolic none of it's real it's all um everything all these books are uh, allegory in some sense and then the first uh, like Irenaeus and, and early church fathers trying to push back against that by saying well we got to take some of it literally but not the parts that contradict with the world around us and our observations and then really yeah since um po- post enlightenment i guess is when they, they really start uh pushing back against that for the most part and then claiming it's traditional <laughs> Which, yeah, um, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, sort of development. It, it's, it's always, in at least in my mind, humbling and important to, to remember that 
some traditions, to use that word again, we, we think of as very ancient are in fact inventions of much more recent time. And I, I think we see a lot of that looking at the, the young earth creationist movement. And another character I want to talk about quickly in your piece is Ellen G. White, the, one of the early leaders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And if I understood correctly, she claimed to have had visions of the formation of Earth. Of, she, she claims to have gone back and, and seen and witnessed the, the creation moments. And what I found so fascinating there is it's sort of a, a claim to, to theological observation. It's, it's very scientific. She is saying that, that she was there to witness empirically the, the creation of the Earth. And, and I think that that is a wonderful illustration of, of the need to, in the 19th and 20th centuries, have a scientific grounding to these new religious movements. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, well, you've got the interpretation correct, and I think um, I think that's a thing we'll have to discuss if we actually want to do a complete episode on Seventh Day Adventism, because generally uh, we look at groups that have, in modern times, very small membership. The Shakers, there are only two Shakers left. Uh, the Strangites, they're about three hundred right. something like that, and Seventh Day Adventism has a, a pretty robust membership, mm -hmm. um, but. Yeah, basically, Ellen White is emerging after a much earlier sort of tradition, the Millerites, who basically they follow a Baptist preacher who predicts the world's going to end in 1844, or rather the second coming of Jesus is going to happen. And of course. after the day comes and he doesn't come back, there are some who basically start thinking, well, maybe he was just off by a year, or maybe he was off by seven years or ten years. And what the Seventh-day Adventists do, the early leaders, including White, they basically say uh, Miller got the date right, but the event wrong. It wasn't that Jesus was literally coming back in an instant and going to sort of bring an end to all things and a start of a new thing, um, because that wouldn't give humans a chance to actually learn anything if he just came back in an instant basically um, this is a start of something new and uh, I think one of the reasons White is such a compelling leader is she does claim to have all sorts of visions which she writes about and one of them is that she goes back in time and literally sees the creation of the world um, as it happens and uh, one of the things that early gap theorists say I think one of the ways to understand that is to actually just return to the Bible. So in the, this is the NIV study Bible, the way Genesis starts, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So that's two verses. Basically gap theorists say, okay, well that in the beginning part and that now the earth part, there's a gap between those two. There's a, point where the universe is formed and then millions and billions of years later God creates the earth in six literal days and Ellen White says no those verses are together it was the universe was created and then everything comes about and I saw this happening and I think the point you make about it being sort of an empirically observable thing is compelling because she actually uh, lambasts geologists for having like the basically for having the gall, the uh, audacity. the audacity to say that they can observe things and they're different. She calls them infidel geologists, basically. Well, this Infidel also... geologists, armchair geologists. It sounds like there are plenty of disparaging names for those who, <laughs> who do not take the, the Bible quite literally. Yeah. Um, for, the, for the sort of scientific um, angle as well, this does remind me of some of the, the groups we've covered um, with... Om Shinrikyo, uh, which we just covered recently, also claiming a lot of very sort of pseudoscience uh, methods in, in a, their members unlocking their various potentials uh, that they preached about. And then it also reminds me of Heaven's Gate um, with, with their very scientific sort of, um, this is a literal spaceship that we're going on. Um, and yeah, that definitely is, is a theme that reoccurs with a lot of new religious movements that, uh, as they're starting out. 
at least I'd like to make a, a, another point, point and thank you guys for for answering those questions but i always have to remind myself in, in a, an attempt at, at sort of historical humility you know, the notion that the the world was going to end in 1844 or it was the second coming seems so you know silly or ignorant or superstitious to us i think we would do well to keep in mind the sort of cultural obsession and trepidation about Y2K mm -hmm. in 1999 and the end of the Maya calendar in 2012. These are very similar events that even if we don't necessarily think of them as as religious in in the, the Christian or Judeo-Christian tradition, certainly at the moment seemed feasible to a large enough group that it was a cultural event for almost everyone involved. Uh, I, 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 for me, it's, it's enough to, to say that these moments have not gone away, even if the way we discuss them have shifted. Well, I think that's one of the other topics we want to do with this, ex, with this extra credit yeah, series. Yeah, that's on our, our to-do list, actually. We, we want to do sort of a, a short history of... Of the end of the world, yeah. Of um, predictions and, and how people respond once those dates fly by, uh, the various ways that the groups uh, respond to that. Yeah, because have, it is... It's more modern than you might think it is. I mean, uh, Pat Robertson even has predicted the end of the world several times, and his his group, the Seven Hundred Club, I believe it is, they still continue to get a variety of donations and support and do the work that they do, despite the fact that uh, that didn't occur. Yep. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm happy to have anticipated some of your your future work, and I think before we we wrap things up here, um, I. These, these conversations, these debates are not going to go away. Of course, the most famous Seventh-day Seventh Adventist now is, is Ben Carson, a, a neurosurgeon, a member of the scientific community, and now a cabinet member in the, the current administration. So, so these, these viewpoints have become increasingly, increasingly mainstream and, and a part of our religious dialogue. So this is not simply historical. This is history that continues to unfold as, as we live it today. So thank you for that reminder. And to sort of end on a, on a note that ties us back to the Activist History Review, I, I was wondering if there's anything to learn or you guys feel that there's anything to learn from studying these, these sects, these new religious movements. And I was particularly interested in sort of the self-imposed uh, isolation of a lot of these groups, the, the ostracism of, of groups like the Shakers, the Oneida community in, in New York, the Amish, the Mormons. I feel like a lot of activists are also socially ostracized and and on the, the fringes of of their the communities in which in which they work. So what lessons are there for, for those of us who are, are continue to try who continue to try to change the world that we live in. Well, I think uh, one of the big lessons, uh, we talked about it in the Shaker episode, is um, once groups start becoming self-isolated, there's that in-group, out-group mentality. I think people on both sides really need to be very careful of that and of, uh, of just not demonizing the other. Uh, we're, we're just doing a recording a Taiping Rebellion episode where um, they Great. quite literally saw their opponents as literal demons. Um, and it's... Uh, interesting how many of these groups start with very, um, very lofty, uh, almost utopian goals in some of the groups, where they're they they have a legitimate complaint or a legitimate dissent um, that makes them outsiders. That there's there are actual serious problems. I mean, uh, even Jonestown um, was was fighting racial segregation from the start, and that was part of what made them outsiders uh, when they were getting started. But once a group becomes isolated and and starts um, viewing the world in their own way and cutting off uh, opposing viewpoints, that's when things can get really violent, is once that escalates um, from both sides. And it's it's the demonizing uh, for, of the people in the in-group and the out-group, whatever those groups are, um, that causes, I think, the most problems is the... Uh, um, so that's why groups like the Shakers and, and the Amish, who have, you know, the Amish have uh, rooms spring where they, they do go out and they, they learn more about the, the rest of the world and... Um, the Shakers, as we mentioned, were constantly, uh, they, they had uh, very strict celibacy, so they were recruiting more members from uh, the rest of the world by conversion and people coming in and keeping them connected with the broader uh, masses of humanity that weren't just on their, um, in their villages. So, yeah, I think keeping, keeping a sense of perspective and not uh, simply dismissing people whose ideas you might hate as, as crazy or stupid, it's very easy to say, you know, how... 
how stupid are they? They believe this a uh, very strange set of beliefs, but it's uh, less to do with intelligence or mental health, as, as people often uh, easily toss out, and more to do with your worldview and the group of people you're surrounding yourself with uh, and whose ideas you're hearing all the time. Um, so just you know don't be uh don't be dogmatic and uh, try not to be too isolated right it sound, sounds like you're saying that individuals and and activist groups who hope to affect change within their community need to remember that they are a part of a community and they cannot set themselves off from it mm-hmm. and still hope to change it right great well, thank you so much for, for having me on your show today. I really look forward to more episodes of Sextra Credits and, of course, your main program at Sex on Sex Ed. Well, thank you very much for joining us. And with that, I think we can uh, bring a close to this episode. If you'd like to, uh, I guess one more question we have for you, though, uh, Corey, is uh, what is the best way, uh, if our listeners are interested in learning more about the activist history of you, what is the best way for them to... Uh, follow and check out your publication great well they can always go to our website which is activisthistory.com they can also look us up on facebook or follow us on twitter our handle is at act hist review so a-c-t h-i-s-t review well thank you very much and of course for anyone listening who's interested in following us on social media you can follow us on facebook and twitter both at sex ed and uh, you can download our show to listen on pretty much any platform where you like to listen to podcasts itunes google play we even have a youtube page uh and share this show with your friends if you enjoy it because if you like our show we'd love you to help it grow so uh thank you very much and thanks for listening to this first episode yep.